Network television is by Jews, for Jews, about Gentiles. <laughs> this is just one of the many wisdoms bestowed upon me by tonight's recipients of the Patty Chayefsky Laurel Award for Television, my mentors and heroes, Marshall Herskovitz and Edward Zwick. <clears throat> When I first met Ed and Marshall, <clears throat> I didn't know what to make of them. Recently finishing 30-something, a show that did nothing less than reinvent the medium, I expected them to be less accessible. I expected them to be less interested in me, an unproduced playwright from Brooklyn who had never spent a day in film school or on a television set. But they seemed interested in me. They wanted to know who I was, what I was thinking, what made me write the things I wrote. Soon I realized that this was part of their process. It was who they were as artists. Every person they worked with, lived with, met, or wandered into was part of a great study of human behavior. It was their raw material, their muse. For such icons, Ed and Marshall seemed at times decidedly unprofessional. They often squabbled with each other like a bickering married couple, not about creative issues to which they were remarkably attuned with one another, but more about stupid shit. They argued a lot about who was gonna get to type into the computer during story meetings whether a window should be open or closed, whose turn it was to choose what restaurant to order in from. They were, in a word, infants. <laughs> Yet to endure a two-hour meeting of their incessant whining was to also learn more about writing, more about story, more about character in a single session that I had in 10 years of studying playwriting. Their story meetings were conversations about life and love and relationships that morphed organically into emotional, nuanced, breathtaking stories. Their storytelling was a brave and raw artistic interpretation of their lives. They were unafraid to look at anything. Opening Pandora's box was their nine to five gig. They weren't just interested in truth, they were interested in the secret unspoken truths that no one would talk about. Dissecting and examining the unutterable was and is their genius. My first encounter with N.M. Marshall was over the phone. I was living in Brooklyn, trying to write plays, working in desktop publishing and making contracts contracts with a phone company to keep my service from getting disconnected. I got a call on my answering machine out of the blue from Edward Zwick's office. I returned the call, Ed got on the phone. He told me that he had read a play I had written and he liked it. I said, thank you. Do you know who I am, he asked. No, I I'm sorry, I don't. He said, well, by way of resume, I'll just list a few things. I created a television show called 30-something. I directed a movie called Glory. I said, okay, I think you could stop there. Within a month of that phone call, Ed and Marshall gave me a script assignment on a show, introduced me to Winnie Holtzman, who became my other mentor and hero, found me an agent, a place to live, and I not, had I not been already married, probably would have hooked me up with a woman as well. Clearly, these two men would do anything to find really inexpensive writers. <laughs> the first script that I wrote for Ed and Marshall was an episode of my so-called life. When I handed in my first draft, Marshall called me up and said, you have to go deeper. He followed that with a bunch of specific thoughts, which I diligently wrote down, but I heard none of since I was in a state of internal hysteria. I hung up the phone and told my wife, I have to go deeper. <laughs> Shit, deeper, I, I, thought you were, I thought you went deep. So did I, apparently I didn't, apparently I'm shallow. I rewritten my script, damn he was right, shallow, shit, what now? The next several weeks I put myself through literary water torture. How does one go deeper when one thought one was already going deep? I watched every episode of 30-something I could get my hands on. I read the pilot of My So-Called Life at least a dozen times. I had long conversations with the kind and patient Winnie Holtzman. I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote, throwing away every single thought, word, idea that in any way could be considered in any way bullshit. With Ed and Marshall, no false note was acceptable. No joke for the sake of a joke was acceptable. Thoughts needed to be dissected. Ideas needed to be paid off. Supporting characters needed to be as clear and cared for as your heroes. Moments needed to be nuanced, earned. When I handed in the next draft, Marshall responded to it with what is to this day the greatest compliment of my career. His reaction was simply, let's shoot this. The high of that moment lasted until Ed returned from a location scout a few days later, <laughs> read the script and had a note himself. Apparently, I had to go deeper. Marshall Herskovitz and Edward Zwick, as creators, writers, directors, and producers, have worked together for three decades under their Bedford Falls uh, company banner. They have forever changed the way we think of television, which so, so shows such as 30-something, 
my so-called life once and again, and quarter life, as well as the telefilms Extreme Close-Up and Special Bulletin. In film, they have written, directed, and or produced a stunning list of seminal works such as Love and Other Drugs, The Last Samurai, Defiance, The Siege, Blood Diamond, Courage Under Fire, Legends of the Fall, Leaving Normal, Glory, About Last Night, Dangerous Beauty, Jack the Bear, I Am Sam, Traffic, and Shakespeare in Love. They have been honored with nine Emmy nominations and have received four Emmy Awards. They have received two Writers Guild Awards, three DGA Awards, AFI's Franklin Schaefer Award, two Humanitas Prizes, two Golden Globes, a BAFTA Award, as well as an Academy Award nomination for producing the film Traffic and an Academy Award for producing the film Shakespeare in Love. Their gift is not only their art that we've gotten to savor for many years, but that they have so generously cultivated and nurtured the career of so many writers, directors, actors, and other artists. Marshall and Ed very simply showed us all what is possible to achieve in an hour of TV. They changed television forever and continue to inspire so many of us who try to follow in that tradition. Now let's hear from some other writers from Marshall and Ed's camp, Winnie Holtzman and Paul Haggis. I first met Marshall Knight in the 80s, and uh, when they hired me on 30-something, and I don't know why they did, but uh, they took a risk, which is what they are known for doing. I remember a note meeting that I was uh, a part of, and the other end of the conversation was, this is just really too depressing. And they went, uh, yeah. And that was the note session. Marshall and Ed taught me how to write, and, uh, and by watching them, I learned how to direct. And I, I, think, uh, I think we all learned a lot from them. And uh, anyways, I'll turn it over to Winnie, and, and just thanks for letting me be part of this. Looks good? Okay, great, thanks. Let's take this off. Do you need to do it again? Okay. The other night, I was out walking by myself on this bridge uh, when I was approached by an angel who showed me what life would be like if Marshall and Ed had never been born. I was homeless and drunk and not in the union. Claire Danes was working at a gap. The angel pointed to a bum nearby and said, that's Jason Kadams. Then we went and watched TV, and it was a lot less interesting. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, Jimmy Stewart lives in this town called Bedford Falls, which is being threatened by the forces of darkness. And everyone in town looks up to Jimmy Stewart, and they look to him to stand up to these forces and do what's right. Because he takes the enormous risk of actually being himself, he is rewarded at the end of the movie by a spontaneous outpouring of love and gratitude which is kind of what's happening here tonight, only everybody's better dressed and in color. So this is my moment, our moment, to thank you both for being the reluctant heroes that you are, for making Bedford Falls into a real place where countless people, myself included, can see themselves and their lives reflected on screen. Congratulations. It's a wonderful night. It's a wonderful life you make it more wonderful. I realize that both of you are deeply ambivalent about awards and praise and pretty much everything else. But please, try to enjoy this just a little. Tomorrow you can go back to being brilliant, i.e. yourselves, utterly discouraged, filled with hope, and dancing by the light of the moon. By the light of the moon. The Patty Chayefsky Laurel Award for Television is the WGAW's highest honor for television writing, given to writers who have advanced the literature of television and made outstanding contributions to the profession of the television writer. It is my privilege to present this year's Patty Chayefsky Laurel Award for television to Marshall Herskovitz and Edwards Wick.
thank you for this. Um, when you're 27, you can't imagine a career. And when you're 57, you can't remember it. <laughs> Go figure. Our, our first job was uh, on a television show on ABC called Family, where Nigel and Carol McKeon were the most patient teachers. And of course, they rewrote every word we wrote. But it's possible we owe our career to a single note we got on that show. We'd written a scene where the teenage Buddy Lawrence, played wonderfully by Christy McNichol, storms into her parents' bedroom and essentially tells them to, well, fuck off. And uh, we get the script back from the executive producer. And next to, that are, next to that scene are written the letters N-O-B. So we go to Len Goldberg, who's a genuinely kind and generous man, and we ask him, what does he mean by the letters N-O-B? And he says, oh, not our buddy. And we say, but, but she's a teenager. And he just smiles and he says, boys, it's TV. At which point we walk out of his office and we look at each other and we vow that someday we're going to write that scene exactly the way we wanted it. We always had this feeling, um, even when we were kids, you know how people in movies and television shows never said goodbye when they hung up the telephone? It used to drive me crazy. <laughs> we wanted to understand what real meant. What do real people do? What do? How do real people live? How does a real argument go instead of a television argument? You know, how messy are people's houses or their marriages? And amazingly, back in 1987, we were allowed to pursue that question by people like Brandon Stoddard and Chad Hoffman and Bob Iger and Ted Harbert. And we were joined in that pursuit by the remarkably talented people who've already spoken, who we thank very deeply, um, and also other people. Uh, Liberty Godshaw, who's here with us tonight, who has essentially contributed all the insight into female characters we've always gotten the credit for. Uh, Richard Kramer, who's with us tonight, who's been with us for, God, too many years. Uh, Susan Shilliday, Joe Daugherty, so, so many other writers who have just been such a joy most of the time to work with, but <laughs> always an honor. And we can't thank you enough. Right, so typically we won't try. Um, but mostly it's been the two of us sitting in a room together, eating the same tuna sandwich year in and year out. And there's a lot to be said um, for writing with another person. And it's not just having someone there to combat the terror and the loneliness. Or to stop me from procrastinating. Yeah, well, somebody had to. But writing together has allowed us to do together what we were too afraid to do alone. See, when you're by yourself, inevitably you come up against your shame and your inhibition. But when there were two of us, we came to realize there would be these, these weird moments when one of us would be talking and suddenly stop and get this this look because he was thinking something he was too embarrassed or too vulnerable to say. And inevitably that was the moment. And the other person would say, what? What are you, what are you thinking? Say that. Write that. And that would always be the gold, the secret private experience that it turned out that everybody would share and say, oh yeah, I know that. That's, that's me. And of course, the next day we'd look at it and what we'd written and we'd hate it and we'd have to write it again. Which, after today and all of this, this amazing award and all the wonderful things you guys said, uh, is what we still have to do tomorrow, even though it's a holiday. We just will start again, face our doubts, our fears, the horrors of a blank page. It's all the same except, of course, tuna has mercury in it, so now it's turkey sandwiches. <laughs> But um, thank you for this. Uh, we will keep trying to deserve it. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.